Well, I'm, I'm very pleased to be able to uh, introduce our keynote speaker for this morning. Tony West um, is the Associate Attorney General for the U.S. Department of Justice. As the third ranking official at DOJ, Mr. West advises and assists the Attorney General and the Deputy Attorney General in formulating and implementing departmental policies and programs on a broad range of issues, including civil litigation, federal and local law enforcement, and public safety. In addition, he oversees the department's civil litigating components, grant-making components, the Office of Tribal Justice, the Executive Office for U.S. Trustees, the Office of Information Policy, the Foreign Claims Settlement Commission, and the Access to Justice Initiative. It is truly an honor to have him with us today uh, to kick off our meeting. I can't think of anyone better, and it's my pleasure to welcome Tony West. Thank you so much, Nancy. Thank you for those very kind words. Uh, I am very pleased to be here and uh, very grateful for the opportunity to speak with you, a very distinguished group of policymakers, researchers, and healthcare and criminal justice professionals. Uh, let me take a moment to uh, also thank Steve Rosenberg and his team at Coaches for organizing this very important gathering and for the terrific work that they do every day to help uh, connect the justice system to our health systems. Uh, let me also express my appreciation uh, to Health Affairs for its support and for publishing uh, what is an outstanding scholarly overview of the topic of jails and the Affordable Care Act uh, in its recent uh, issue. Uh, my thanks as well to the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, uh, the Langlaw Foundation, and the Public Welfare Foundation for their support. So let me, uh, let me begin by commending all of you uh, for taking the lead uh, on what is a difficult but vitally significant challenge. In our national discussion about uh, health care, you represent a perspective that is as important as it is provocative. Uh, you hope to broaden coverage, not just to those who are uninsured, but to those who have, at one time or another, found themselves entangled with the criminal justice system. You recognize that for all of the sound and fury, the undeniable and the powerful fact is that the Affordable Care Act holds the promise of expanding health care coverage to almost everyone in America and in no small measure by potentially opening the Medicaid enrollment to some 15 million low-income adults, including the millions of individuals who come in contact with our criminal justice system, of whom upwards of 90% are uninsured. And you recognize something else. You recognize that this moment is a moment of opportunity, uniquely positioned at the intersection of public health and public safety, a chance to reform correctional health care, to improve the health of our communities, and to enhance public safety. It's an opportunity that is born of necessity as leaders across the political spectrum seek ways to better align our criminal justice investments with outcomes that actually make us safer. Seizing this opportunity and capitalizing on this moment is a goal that we at the Department of Justice share with all of you. We are fortunate to be led by an attorney general who understands what's at stake when we talk about the health of the justice-involved population. Attorney General Holder's Smart on Crime Initiative is a comprehensive criminal justice reform effort which recognizes that while the aggressive enforcement of federal criminal statutes, that remains the department's central law enforcement mission, experience teaches us that we simply cannot arrest, prosecute, and incarcerate our way to becoming a safer, better nation. And like you, we understand that public health and public safety often walk hand in hand. 
that the public policy investments we make yield the greatest returns when they reflect the importance of that connection. And that key to making our community safer is reducing recidivism by focusing on reentry, which in turn means focusing on the physical and mental health of incarcerated and formerly incarcerated individuals. Because here's what we know. On any given day, some one and a half million people are being held in state and federal prisons. 12 million more cycle through local jails every year. And as a nation, we spend about $80 billion, $80 billion a year. And the vast majority of those that we incarcerate will be released and will return to their communities at a rate of almost 640,000 a year. And most of them, two out of three on the local level, they fail, finding themselves rearrested re within three years, often at additional enormous cost to family, community, and the taxpayers. And once released, these individuals, they face a myriad of challenges from renting an apartment to filling out a job application. But perhaps none is greater than the challenge they face to stay sober, stable, and healthy. Because we also know that the incarcerated population carries substantially higher rates of medical, psychiatric, and substance abuse problems than the general population. Rates of communicable diseases like hepatitis C, tuberculosis, and HIV and AIDS are higher among inmates. An estimated 39 to 43 percent suffer one or more chronic health conditions. And men and women in this population suffer at three times the rate of mental illness and four times the rate of substance abuse problems as compared to the general public. By the time individuals enter the correction system, they are often, as uh, one noted researcher uh, put it, at their sickest. So this is the shape of our challenge. But fortunately, we have a path forward. We know that health care coverage and the access to adequate health services can decrease the risk of individuals becoming involved with the criminal justice system in the first place. A recent study based on Florida Medicaid enrollees found that adults with serious mental illnesses were less likely to be arrested after being discharged from the hospital if they received routine outpatient treatment, including medication. Moreover, when individuals do come into contact with correctional facilities, we can dramatically improve the odds for successful reentry if we address their health and mental health needs once they enter corrections and, and ensure continuity of health care once they leave. And it's the Affordable Care Act, through its Medicaid expansion provisions, that provide us with this unique opportunity to reduce recidivism while improving public health. In Washington State, for example, state funding was expanded for substance abuse treatment to low-income individuals who were frequently involved with the criminal justice system, a population that essentially mirrors those who are covered by the Medicaid expansion. And in the 12 months that followed treatment, arrests declined by more than 17 percent compared to a control group that didn't receive treatment. Now this decline in arrests resulted in nearly three dollars in justice-related savings for every dollar spent on treatment. And at the same time, we saw medical expenditures for this group also go down. Now, other state research shows similar trends. And one recent study indicated that providing more and more effective treatment in prison and immediately upon release would save $17 billion 
in criminal justice costs. It's for this reason that state policies which terminate rather than suspend Medicaid benefits once someone is incarcerated can actually undermine our efforts to reduce recidivism since they make it much harder for the newly released to obtain insurance coverage. And we know that the first few days and weeks after release is the critical period when relapse and even death are most acute. One study found that formerly incarcerated individuals are 13 times more likely to die within the first 12 weeks after release. So through the Affordable Care Act, we can deliver health care treatment to a population that desperately needs it, while at the same time enhancing public safety and saving taxpayer dollars. And by ensuring essential benefits, ensuring that, it's, that certain essential benefits are provided to new Medicaid enrollees, the Affordable Care Act ensures that services, especially those services that are particularly significant for those who are involved with the criminal justice system. The Affordable Care Act ensures that those services will be available to them. Services such as those for mental health and substance abuse treatment that the law requires to be covered on par with other medical treatment. And in the incarcerated population where anywhere from 15 to 30 percent meet the criteria for a serious mental illness and almost two-thirds are in need of treatment for substance abuse disorder. These types of benefits, they can make the critical difference between success or failure upon release. You know, many states and, and communities already realize this. Uh, in Chicago, inmates at the Cook County Jail are systematically being enrolled in Medicare or I'm excuse me, in Medicaid as part of the intake process. The county has submitted more than 4,000 applications on behalf of inmates since January 1st. In the Portland, Oregon area, more than 1,200 inmates have been enrolled through the state health ex insurance exchange. And other states and local jurisdictions have taken important and innovative steps to improve continuity of coverage as well. New York, for example, employs a practice of indefinite suspension of Medicaid benefits, which means that time spent behind bars doesn't factor into an inmate's annual redeter redetermination of eligibility for benefits. And at the federal level, we are looking to uh, step up our game as well. Uh, much of the work that's being done by the Federal Interagency Reentry Council, which is chaired by the Attorney General, focuses on reducing the collateral consequences of incarceration and increasing access to employment, treatment, and civic participation. Now, our reentry our re council partners at the Department of Health and Human Services have encouraged states to suspend rather than terminate Medicaid benefits and they now incentivize correctional health providers to adopt the use of electronic health records. In fact, the Departments of Justice and Health and Human Services are jointly supporting a three-year pilot project to test the efficacy of enrolling prison and jail inmates in Medicaid prior to release. And we're tracking usage, we're tracking employment, and we'll track recidivism outcomes along the way. At the Department of Justice, the Attorney General recently announced that the Department will require halfway houses in the federal system to offer standardized treatment to prisoners with mental health and substance abuse issues. And once fully implemented, these services will be available to every single one of the approximately 30,000 inmates who are released through halfway houses each year helping to promote consistency and continuity of care between federal prisons and community-based facilities. And today, uh, I'm pleased to announce that we are taking yet another important step 
to expand health care coverage for those who come into contact with the criminal justice system. This morning, our Bureau of Justice Assistance released a new solicitation requesting proposals to help states and local jurisdictions maximize Medicaid and marketplace resources on behalf of justice-involved individuals. We're looking for innovative ideas to aid in all aspects of health care planning, from diversion alternatives and intake screening at the front end to reentry programs at the back end. We want to be able to provide in-depth assistance to select jurisdictions on implementation of the Affordable Care Act, as well as policy guidance for all states and localities. Because our goal is to ensure that we are making the wisest decisions, providing the most effective incentives, and encouraging the best practices when it comes to investing our resources at the intersection of public health and public safety. So we're working uh, on many fronts to take advantage of the historic opportunity that the Affordable uh, Care Act gives us. But of course, collectively, we can and we must do more. We must make it standard practice to assess the health care needs of individuals as soon as they come into the criminal justice system, being thoughtful about our options and in basing decisions on individual needs. We should be willing to consider detention alternatives such as drug and mental health courts. And we should make health care enrollment part of the intake and discharge processes for all inmates. We must develop partnerships between correctional facilities and community health programs to promote information exchange and, ex and ensure continuity of care. And we must target our actions to those who need these services the most. Because many of those who enter the justice system, they come from and return to some of our country's most disadvantaged communities. They are largely poor and disproportionately of color. And in far too many cases, the only health care they know comes through a hospital emergency room in response to a violence-related injury. The Affordable Care Act gives us the chance to provide those with the highest risks and the greatest needs access to quality health care in a way that promotes public health and safety and potentially drives down recidivism rates and taxpayer costs. Now, to be sure, none of this will come easily or quickly, for there is, the philosopher wrote many centuries ago, nothing more difficult to take in hand, more perilous to conduct, or more uncertain in its success than to take the lead in the introduction of a new order of things. But the good news, the good news is that you have already sown the, the seeds of success. You have begun to demonstrate what we can accomplish when we commit ourselves to improving public health and safety while strengthening our communities and respecting individual dignity. I want you to know that the Department of Justice stands with you and we thank you for your dedication and all that you were doing to help protect America's communities. Thank you for having me.